Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Hello, horror hounds, and welcome to Now Slaying, an It Slays podcast production where we break down the latest and greatest in the world of horror. I'm your not-so-humble host, Colton. I'm Rowan. And today on the show, we're going to be reviewing The Black Phone, which was released today, June 24th, 2022, exclusively in theaters. Uh, but as per usual, before we get into the review discussion, uh, Rowan, I just wanted to ask, uh, how familiar are you with Scott Derrickson's filmography? Uh and based off of that, were you looking forward to the Black Phone? Uh, so I don't have it sitting in front of me, but I do know that he is responsible for Sinister, uh, yeah. which, you know, is a favorite of mine. Uh, I, I think that movie scares me every time I watch it. I think a tentpole of Blumhouse. So is it Blumhouse? Yeah, that put it out. Yep. Yeah. So uh, I'm pretty familiar uh, with them just f- for that reason. And then obviously, I think the non horror world kind of knows him now is, you know, the Doctor Strange guy. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe not anymore, but uh, the original Doctor Strange guy. And I'm not talking about yeah. that Doctor Strange from like 1970s or 80s. Yeah. So I, I mean, that's pretty much my only familiarity with him. Uh, he also did that remake, didn't he, of uh, The Earth Stood Still or whatever? He did, yeah, back in, like, 2007 or 2008, I think. Which I missed. I, like, totally didn't watch it because I was scared it wasn't going to be any good. I saw that bad boy in theaters, and I always get it mixed up with that uh, Nick Cage movie uh, about, like, numbers. Knowing, I think it was. Oh, I think that's the what knowing. It was knowing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I mean that that's my familiarity with him. Uh what about you? Yeah, I I'm pretty similar to yourself. I saw Sinister in theaters when it came out and I remember me and my friend, I think it was Skylar at the time, we were like pretty scared shitless by Sinister. Like uh <laughs> we loved the the found footage aspect to it and uh at the time like Bagool, I think it was kind of hitting right when uh like Slenderman was kind of popular on the internet. So uh-huh. it was kind of like a a happy accident that all these things came together and Sinister was really effective for me. Um, as I mentioned, I saw the day the earth stood still. Uh, I can't remember if I've actually seen the exorcism of Emily Rose. Oh, did Obviously, he do that? He did, yeah. That's like a early 20s Rowan classic. That's like a movie store classic that was yeah. on, uh, you know, the poster was on the wall of uh, every movie uh, rental spot for I don't know years. And I don't think I was allowed to watch it. Like, I think my mom explicitly was like, don't watch that. So I can't remember if I went against their word and watched it or not. If um, not, you definitely you definitely should. I remember really liking that one. Yeah, I mean, growing up and even into my teens, like I always found exorcism movies like the scariest, like possession movies, uh, probably due to my religious background. So yeah, if I haven't seen it, I definitely should. Uh, obviously, I've seen Doctor Strange. Everybody else has seen Doctor Strange. Um, so yeah, I'm familiar with the guy. I'm also kind of familiar with uh, the writer for this movie too, C. Robert Cargill. They uh, work together. I think he wrote uh, Doctor Strange, but he's just like a, a very supportive presence on screenwriting Twitter, which is uh, not a very uh, welcoming spot. It's just essentially <laughs> people arguing over how to properly write uh, screenplays all the time. So he's just overall seems like a pretty nice dude on there. So yeah, I was I was rooting for the black phone, and I was excited to see it. Have you happened to have read the original story it was based on by Joe Hill? So I was not even aware of this story. Oh, okay. My Joe Hill knowledge is pretty minimal. I don't think I've ever read a book he's written. Uh, I've read comics that he's written, but yeah, yeah. never a book. And the only other like familiarity I have really with him is... Uh, like the Nosferatu show, mm-hmm. um, yeah. which, which I'm like a big fan of. So knowing okay. knowing that piece of work, I was like pretty excited because I I also really enjoyed his comic book work. So I was like, hey, mm-hmm. like two for two so far for Joe Hill for me. So I was yeah. like, maybe this will be a slapper. Yeah, when you were going into this, were you did you know that it was based on a short story by Joe Hill, or did you, were you not? Did you not know that at all? Because I knew that going in, and I was kind of. <laughs> so I, I, I don't know. I was looking for like 
does the story warrant, you know, an hour and 40 minutes was kind of what I was thinking. <laughs> so I would, yeah, I was aware simply only because like I was, you know, last time I was in a chapters or whatever, like they had a little setup of like the black phone book. Oh, gotcha. That you could like buy and they had like the movie poster cover on them and stuff. So I was mm. like, oh, okay, like we're in promo mode right now. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I know, obviously. I knew him as Stephen King's son, and uh, I, you know, I've known of Horns and Nosferatu, like, before they were adapted, and I have a friend who is very well read in Stephen King. I think he's probably read every single Stephen King book, um, so... He's also read a lot of Joe Hill's work, and when I was asking him about the Black Phone, he's like, oh, no, I read that, like, a decade ago, let's say. Like, he couldn't even remember the specifics of the story anymore because it's been so long. But yeah, I know personally I haven't read it either, so all I knew about going into this movie was essentially a lot of the hype around it. Um, the it hype had a very early, is. Yeah, it had a very early screening back in uh, October of 2021 in L.A., and... Uh, Basically, my Twitter exploded after they, you know, screened it and everyone was saying it's going to be like a new horror classic. People were very like, you know, (laughs) ravenous for this movie. And at the time it was coming out in February. And I think based off of that feedback, they moved it to a June slot because they were like, no, this is going to be a huge horror movie. And yeah, I mean, I guess we're going to have to get into the specifics after the trailer if it worked or not for us. But uh, yeah, that's kind of what I knew going into it. So yeah, I was very much looking forward to it. But uh, it's probably enough beating around the bush. We should probably kick it over to the trailer and, uh, you know, get into that uh, review discussion. <laughs> you goof. You see that? Yeah. Huh? Would you hand me my hat? Yes, sir. I am a part-time magician. Would you like to see a magic trick? Who is this? You know all our names? You're getting out of here. Hang up the phone! Now! What you just heard is from The Black Phone, directed by Scott Derrickson and written by Scott Derrickson and C. Robert Cargill, and the story is as follows. Following a string of child abductions in the area, 13-year-old Finney soon finds himself imprisoned in a soundproof basement by a child killer known as The Grabber. With each passing day, Finney's situation grows all the more dire, and he's destined to become The Grabber's next victim until he starts receiving calls on an old black telephone. Now, here on Now Slaying, we like to keep things uh, relatively spoiler-free at first, before making it very obvious when we're going to jump into the spoiler-filled discussion. Uh, This is a movie that I feel like the trailers already spoiled everything for you anyways, but... uh, you know, we'll, we'll try and do a better job than the trailers and not uh, essentially show, you know, the climax and the ending of the movie. So with all that in mind, uh, Rowan, what are your uh, spoiler free thoughts on the black phone? So the black phone. <laughs> yep. <laughs> As we alluded before the trailer, uh, the hype was like real on this one. I feel like I've been watching trailer releases for this. It feels like years in years, my whole life, I feel like I've just been seeing promo <laughs> for this movie. And I mean, we were, you know, I, I, I think everyone was hyped. Ethan Hawke's Return the Horror with yeah. how beloved Sinister is, I think, in general. Like, not just the horror community, but I, I think even just like a movie, general moviegoer community. Like, people love Sinister. Everyone knows Sinister. Yeah, sat in the theater. I, I felt it was going to be a banner because the theater was almost packed. Same with my theater. Pretty much absolutely packed. And I uh, switched my screening time right at the last second I was supposed to see it today but I I got a chance to see it last night and uh yeah dude I had to like cram myself in between a couple of people like to get a decent seat it was it was pretty packed yeah which I mean I was gonna say if you listen to like enough of these now slayings now you know we're usually uh me and Colton are in a theater with like one old man or like just (laughs) yeah random couple of teenagers yeah, yeah they probably don't even know what they're seeing uh exactly i i was almost like giddy with the anticipation because i'm like oh shit like i can't even think about the last time i've been in a theater this busy you know i went and saw top gun there like last week and there was less people in top gun and i thought that was busy wow 
So I was like, oh no, the black phone. Is it uh, the new Top Gun? Everyone's wondering. Rowan, is it the new Top Gun? <laughs> uh, I was, I was going to say, I should make it so vague, you just never know what I think about it. Yeah, for real. Starting off, I was pretty excited. I thought it was a pretty, I don't know if this will sound weird, but I thought it was like a pretty strong uh, credit intro like it's my first note it uh you could definitely see the influences which i'm not i i was gonna save it for spoiler but it's not a spoiler uh there's a lot of texas chainsaw references in the movie uh like there's a couple so you get that feel we get that kind of true crime you know i'm not gonna say it's like hardcore influenced by texas chainsaw but i i Exilia saw this with me and I leaned over and I said to her, I feel like I'm watching a Netflix crime documentary like in the theater. It just had that kind of mm. intro feel. So I was uh, I was really digging it. Uh, we're in the 70s. I guess uh, I guess the last year we're just in this like 70 going back to the 70s for all our horror films. Yeah, I think people got sick of the 80s. So they were like, <laughs> well, instead of going to the 90s and doing something that would be nostalgic to Colton, let's just go back a decade further to like further divorce the nostalgia from him. So I'm just I have absolutely no frame of reference. So, yeah, we're in the 70s. I feel like my satisfaction pretty much ended at that intro. (laughs) Oh my God. All right. I, like I said, I'm really trying to, as we said, it's kind of hard not to spoil anything because it's not a complicated story. I think to say the least, I feel like if you're listening to this episode, you, you probably have seen the trailer. And guess what? You saw the trailer. You know the story. Yeah. I think this is one of the real difficult things that a lot of films have issue with when you adapt a short story or like a novella or something like that where I don't I don't think an hour 40 or whatever runtime it was really needed in this. <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, we haven't even got to our recommend what we recommended. And uh, yeah. Yeah, you're you're definitely a little bit uh, more negative on it than I am. But I will agree that I don't think an hour and 40 was needed for this. I think, um, a, I what think I a will... cool hour 20. I think they probably could have shaved it. Dude, I honestly think uh, you could probably edit a good like 10 to 15 minute short film out of this. And it'd be. <laughs> okay, <laughs> listen, I was trying to. A really big. <laughs> You know, it'd be like a festival contender. Like, everyone would love this, like, little horror short, you know? I was trying to be really nice. I 100% agree (laughs) with that. (laughs) Yeah. Well, uh, I'll take it over from there. And like I said, I think I liked it a little bit more than you. My first note was the opening credit sequence. And uh, it has, I think, uh, Mark Corvin, I think his name is. He does the score for this, who he worked with Robert Eggers, right? So I did think uh, some of the music was really good in it. It really sets a tone. Um, with that opening credit sequence and that's actually a great way to describe it like this uh true crime netflix vibe but kind of with something a little bit sinister not you know i'm not trying to (laughs) not trying to make a pun but you know there's something else below the surface and i kind of liked how that was the vibe of the movie for probably the first 20 to 30 minutes there's a point in this movie where it's kind of like all right it seems like a, a true crime uh serial killer documentary and then there's like some trappings and shades of like Stephen King and I was kind of like okay is it going to be like a a group of kids kind of trying to solve or trying to find this killer and like as you've seen from the trailers and as I even said in the summary the movie changes quite dramatically when the main character gets abducted and what I will say is from that point on I didn't really enjoy it all too much it got um what i would say is very repetitive basically the movie does the same thing beat for beat probably about a half a dozen times and then it's over essentially (laughs) like that's kind of what it does you watch like the same pattern just happen for about an hour straight and yeah it's basically credits are rolling that being said i i do actually think like the child performances are pretty good in the movie i don't know if you disagree or not but specifically uh mason thames who plays finney and his sister, uh, Madeline McGraw, as Gwen. I thought both of them had really good performances. Gwen, a little bit less so, only when she has to do, like, prayer and, like, asking God for help and stuff. That was a little bit too, like, cheesy and cute. But uh, by and large, I was really impressed with the performances. I mean, if the, you know, the two child actors, the main one, sucked, this movie would be worse, for sure. Like, if they were absolute oh, yeah. garbage. Yeah. So, 
I, I, I at least bought into their performances. I don't know. Did you like their performances even? Yeah, no, I was, I was pretty much a fan of most of the, most of the kids performances. I thought, I thought they did a good job. Cause like you said, they're, especially when you're getting into child actor performances, like it can go bad pretty quick. I, I was really impressed with, uh, the actor that played Finn. I thought that mm-hmm. character was totally believable. Um, and they had like some heavy kind of heavy topics and themes and work in this. For sure. And I'd like to get into that a little bit too, just because another note I have is that I think the characterization once again is pretty strong for the first about 20 to 30 minutes. Like I felt like I knew Finn and Gwen's relationship. I felt like I knew their relationship with their alcoholic and abusive father, which is a, a trope from every Stephen King novel, pretty much. And I guess Joe Hill <laughs> took that as well, or the screenwriter for the movie did. And I thought they were really establishing like a really effective world and relationships and kind of branching out even like some of the bullies at school. Like I was I was recognizing the characters, the faces, knowing their motivations, knowing what type of kids they were. And then it's like, once again, the movie just completely changes. And it's like, all right, now we're a bottle movie for the next hour, pretty yeah. much, you know, with some small tweaks but yeah what what do you think about ethan hawk in the movie because honestly if if you're going to this movie to see ethan hawk he's in about 10 to 15 minutes of the movie probably and honestly i don't know if he really did much for me i know you're a big mask guy which is kind of why i wanted to ask you about him but i didn't find him that creepy i'm gonna say and i wasn't like that amazed by it like it was pretty much a non-starter i thought for me he was he was fine you know but almost like anybody in a mask would have been fine yeah so i mean i'm a i'm a big ethan hawk fan and obviously yeah i I love horror masks and i did love the look of these masks okay and like i love you know we'll get more into it but the interchangeability of the masks Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, like I thought just kind of a phone in, I felt it, it was just like you said, he, he's not in it very long. So if you're going to see this for him, it's really not worth it. It's also a, I feel a role that anyone could have done. They could have just had any D- Joe off the street do yeah. it and it would have been fine because you barely see him and we don't ever like we, we don't get any motivation. We don't ever learn mm-hmm. anything about this character it's not developed so yeah, yeah it's, it's a character that has a yeah it has a it has a creepy mask or a scary mask and of course with a mask you can see the eyes and sometimes you can see like an intensity there like boiling beneath the surface but yeah it's <laughs> it, it there's not a lot i think you could have threw the mask on me and i could have sat there and been just <laughs> as terrifying for most of it or anybody who was doing like a a menacing voice at times right it's i don't know i was i was definitely a little bit disappointed by that and also, I was kind of disappointed with how much of this movie is, like, actually a horror movie. Obviously, we won't get into any details. There are some paranormal aspects to the movie, but it's honestly, like, more of a thriller. And when I left the movie, I, I googled, I was like, is this even a rated R movie? I, I, And then I was like, oh, they, like, swear a couple times in the movie. And I was like, is that what made it a rated R? And I, I kind of think so. Like, I don't know, maybe there's an example of you know in your head of like an extremely gory scene but in my head it was very very tame i basically the movie has a lot of restraint in the beginning and it doesn't even show like how the kids are getting abducted like it'll fade to black before you see what happens and this creates kind of like it allows your uh, imagination to run wild and you're kind of wondering god what is happening here like how is he abducting them what is he doing to these kids and when we are given the answers to these questions they're not scarier than what we already had in our head and it's kind of just oh okay yeah he's just doing exactly what any other child killer abductor would do it it wasn't like, like i don't know it was like i was expecting so much more from this like especially when you label it as a horror movie and i heard so many people saying this movie was terrifying and it's just like yeah it's like what you said it's like a just like a netflix true crime thing Pretty yeah much. yeah no i i 100 percent agree with that yeah so i guess uh <laughs> rowan do you recommend the movie there's more i want to say but it's like i don't want to start drilling into like certain story choices or certain characters because i don't want to give too much away even though like i said if you've seen the trailer you've had this thing basically spoiled for you and uh i think if you have half a brain you'll have most of the movie figured out within about 15 to 20 minutes anyways but uh yeah, would you recommend the Black Phone? Yeah, so I'm going to say uh, 
stay away from it in the theater. I think if you're like a big Joe Hill, Stephen King fan, like just wait till it comes to like VOD or, you know, streaming or other ways you can procure the film. I wouldn't, I wouldn't spend my money again. This, you know, this isn't uh, one I'm going to see again in the theater. Uh, What about you, Colton? Yeah, like I said, I... I do think the movie's fairly competent. I think a lot of it's really good. I think, well, I said a a lot of it's really good. Like I said, the performances are good and the technical craftsmanship of the movie so much is good. Like Scott Derrickson, in my opinion, like knows how to direct the movie. Like, you know, it it seems professional. It didn't seem like I was watching some like small budget indie movie, right? It's, I believe that it was set in the seventies. I believe the graininess and the grittiness of the movie. And, you know, I believed what they were trying to accomplish. It was just very disappointing that like there wasn't really any twists or thrills or really, I I was just sitting there and basically almost the whole movie played out what I expected. I'd I'd probably give it a very soft recommend. I'm still not a hundred percent made up I mean maybe in the spoiler discussion I'll kind of formulate an opinion exactly where I fall on it but I would very softly recommend it Uh, I would definitely say don't believe the hype and uh it's certainly not the next big horror movie that's gonna like blow everybody's socks off it's not like you know it's um it's yeah I I don't know go check it out if you want to check it out if not you would probably be fine not seeing it I guess you know <laughs> so uh I was going to say before we before we get into uh the spoiler section I figure we should like let people know uh you know, what they should listen for. This is the spot where I'm going to talk like I'm listening to something because then I'm going to impose that and put it in. But basically, Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we're going to inform you from, you know, now on uh, when we're going in that spoiler section, you're going to hear this sound. Wow, what a sound. (laughs) Yeah, you'll know that uh, it's kind of like your purge warning. That uh, we're going to purge all the details. So Yeah, make sure to scramble over to your phone and pause it and, you know, come back once you've actually seen the black phone if you don't want to be spoiled. So, yeah, we're getting into the spoiler-filled discussion of the black phone. And, like I said, there, <laughs> everything that you want to know from this movie is essentially spoiled in the, the trailer. And even as someone like myself, I didn't watch the trailers going in at all. But what I kind of guessed from some of the, the, the talk online was that, okay, this is a kid that when he answers the phone, he's going to be consorting with <laughs> dead people was kind of what I was assuming. But after the movie kind of has uh, the first interaction with the dead kid on the phone, which is one of the, you know, the grabber's previous victims, and he kind of points him you know, hey, go dig in this section of the floor. I was like, oh, this movie is just going to be completely constructing kind of like a trap that Ethan Hawke is going to fall into near the end of the movie. And that's how he's going to escape, essentially. I don't know if it was that blatant for you right away, but I was like, he's not going to Shawshank Redemption tunnel himself out of here. But what could you do with a hole essentially in the floor? Right. Was it that blatant to you it was 100 percent that blatant to me and i feel like if i remember correctly the like in the trailer you kind of get the hint that he's talking to like someone in this not plugged in phone because i yeah. i'm pretty sure they have a scene in it where kids are talking to him like voices and they're like it's the the scene where he's like learning the punch and all that yes. stuff yeah So, you know, I knew that coming right into it. I was like, okay, like this is, I knew the supernatural aspects were going to be there immediately. And then, you know, kind of in the non-spoiler free uh, section, what we alluded to, uh, my overall spoiler opinion is just like you, uh, you know, uh, Finney gets kidnapped and then this movie sucks. (laughs) We get into this kind of paranormal slash supernatural like area that is very Stephen King, very fire startery. Like mm-hmm. th- there's a weird thread in this film where we get a couple of dialogue scenes that mention so the sister like has dreams and she sees basically the future and what where these what's happening with these kids but 
you know, it's a dream, so it's all mixed up, and she doesn't... Confused, yeah. She doesn't know what's uh, real and what's fiction, yeah. And then we drop the thread that I just groaned at, where we are then informed as an audience that her mother also had the same thing. And guess what? That's it. We don't ever explore anything that has to do with that, because... We, we basically get a bad excuse that, for some reason, like, she's the reason this dad is an alcoholic. And also, you know, we read a newspaper heading about, you know, how rough these vets have it and their funding is yeah. being cut. Yeah, it's like we... <laughs> We get this thread that like, oh, there's, you know, this is hereditary and all this stuff, but it doesn't matter because we're never going to explore it. And it's just used as kind of this like really undeveloped excuse for this dad to be a giant piece of shit. Yeah, I kind of regret not mentioning that there's a really glaring just dropped plot point in the non-spoiler section and not really getting into it. But honestly, like the sister's... Uh, Deja Rev or Clairvoyance or whatever you want to call it was it didn't make me groan because I was like okay he's paying homage to kind of like the telekinetic children that like Stephen King yeah you know, liked to do so many so much in his novels but where I especially groan and it kind of wears my patience thin is that she is uh, like she doesn't factor into helping the kid escape at all whether or not her his sister was dead or didn't even exist at all, like Finn was going to escape with or without her. Basically, all she does is lead the cops in the third act of the movie to the wrong house across the road where the children are being uh, buried in the basement. And it just kind of left me wondering, like, why did we really waste time spent like developing this at all? You could have shaved off ten minutes. She could have just been a really strong, strong-willed kind of cracking jokes, a, f- a firecracker of a sister that like misses yeah. her brother and was trying to like solve the case herself or kind of getting in the way. She didn't need to have this telepathic ability, especially when it doesn't impact anything in the third act. It was completely just thrown in there. I, I, maybe a red herring, maybe to misdirect us and think that she was gonna see the future and rescue him but i I don't know i was i was just kind of like that was a waste of screen time because like you said they they spend all this time uh mentioning that her mother had it and don't ever believe your dreams and ignore them and it's like a a a rule with her and her father like not to mention it so i was like there got to be some payoff for this and i guess the payoff is finding you know the children but realistically if finn would have escaped told the police anyways they probably would have checked, you know, the one house across the street also in the dude's name, you know? Like, yeah. I, I don't know, man. That was, ugh. There's a lot of plot points or, or just points in the plot that don't make sense that you just, you have to be the kind of person that's just really willing to be like, sure, like, I don't care, like, that this is just a blatant, like, mistake that probably would never happen, such as, like, we're not going to check the second house in this guy's name. We're only going to check the one. Well, the biggest one for me is the brother. And I don't know if he drove you fucking crazy, but man, I hated that guy in this movie. He, like, basically, Ethan Hawke has a cokehead brother. And if you're listening to this section, you already know this. But man, that character does not need to be in the movie at all. It, it just creates so many plot holes about like, okay, maybe they live on separate separate sides of the house. I'm not sure. It didn't really look like a duplex to me from outside side but maybe they have it how do you not see ethan hawk sitting shirtless all night in the you know the kitchen waiting for (laughs) the kid to come up from the basement how is the dog not more reacting to people screaming all the time i understand they say it's soundproof but then we get a shot outside showing that no it's not quite soundproof you still can't hear the kid screaming from outside he's supposed to be like this guy who's triangulating the position of the grabber and it very clearly just points to his own house but he's like oh my brother is gone all the time and he's a weird guy but you know i'm not gonna suspect him at all until like it's very convenient in the third act for me to suspect them i honestly believe that brother was in the movie purely so the movie could have a little bit more bloodshed like in its third act because it was just relatively bloodless <laughs> you know it was well and they and they want they're like listen we need we need two people from sinister in this movie so yes that as well obviously but so they're like we know you're gonna recognize this guy and you guys are gonna love it it doesn't matter if this character makes sense but like let's talk about it because his death is really the only horror of this film and it looks like shit i was like this looks terrible oh i never even noticed it what what was it for you that made it look like shit was it just 
was it like CGI or something or what what was it? I mean, if someone's listening to this, please let me know. I didn't read anything about this. I thought it looked CGI, and if it didn't, it was just terrible practical effects, but Okay. Like when the axe went into his head, A, we see the axe go into his head and we get like minimal time on that. Like I really felt I don't know, obviously, like you said, they swear a bit in this, so we get that rating. But I feel yeah. like the aim of this was not to get that rating. And it was just like it was a lackluster kill. I mean, you knew the minute he opened the door, you're like, yeah, like this guy, there was no subtlety to it. You're like, Mm -hmm. this guy's a goner. As I continued to say, especially with, you know, the grabber and Ethan Hawke's character, like, I didn't care because I don't know, I don't know anything about this character. And they haven't built this, like, you know, you don't know anything about him, so he's mysterious, Like, he just has all these weird habits that I probably needed some explanation. Like, why is he obsessed with this Naughty Boy game? And, like, yeah, is it, like, is this a psycho, like, childhood trauma issue? Or, like, I needed some more explanation in that just because the mystery wasn't enough because he wasn't intriguing enough. Yeah, I completely agree. Like, how we said that, uh, certain plot points are just kind of dropped and not fully explained. There's a lot of moments with that, uh, the grabber in this movie that it's, I think it's hinting at something greater. Um, like it talks about how he just wanted to go down there to watch him, you yeah. know, and I'm like, okay. Or he talks about how the phone didn't work since he was a kid. Uh, there's a reference I think to like his father at some point or something like there's, there's multiple things that it's like, okay, maybe this guy was severely abused. Maybe, maybe there was something more to this. Maybe his father was a killer. Maybe it's some divine or paranormal reason or, you know, that he has to do this. But I I just could never kind of get over the fact that the name of the killer is the grabber. He wants to play a game like about naughty and nice boys He's staring at a little kid while he's sleeping, and I don't think any of it is supposed to be, like, pedophilic in the way that the the movie's portraying it. Like, I don't think that's his motivation, but it seemed really strange. It seemed like the movie kind of wanted to conjure some of that, those thoughts in your head without ever actually, like, going there at all. Which, once again, I'm fine with not showing any of that on screen, but it's it's really s- strange to be kind of skirting around all this shit. Like, I don't know, it, it's just weird. I, I, I needed something to explain something about this killer like yeah you know and it's weird to say because most of the time we don't want anything explained with a killer it's kind of like we just want them to be inherently scary we want it to be you know that that's usually enough the more we know the the less scary it gets but it, it was like this movie wanted to tell us stuff about the killer and we never got it like we got no motivation we got no reason with the masks we got nothing like Nothing. There was just nothing to really latch on to this guy other than a creepy mask, you know? You know, kind of like you said, it kept wanting to, like, it was trying to give you those, like, true crime and true crime of, like, pedophile, like a pedophile case or something like that, yes. which, yeah. and to me, like, if we want to go there, cool, like, because guess what? That probably would have been scarier than what we got. It's like, if you're going to go there, go there. Don't have yeah. him shirtless upstairs waiting for a kid to come upstairs with a belt in his hand with his legs spread wide and the way the like camera's angled is very much like you're supposed to be looking at Ethan Hawke's like crotch essentially and his mask in the scene and it's like once again it's putting those ideas in our head but the movie never really rationalizes if if that's the reason and none of the kids talk about that like when they're on the phone right so like I don't think that was the ultimate goal like I don't think he was going to try and sexually assault Finn I think he was just going to murder him But the movie, like, consistently puts those thoughts in your head. And, like, basically what you're saying, if that was the case, it would be far more horrific as well. Like, once again, I don't want to see it acted out on screen. But, like, if you're you're putting the thoughts there, like, at least go (laughs) what you're doing. Like, they knew what they were doing. Like, it's impossible. Your your guy's named the Grabber, and he's, like, horny and talking about naughty boys and shit all the time. (laughs) Like, what is this? Yeah, if you're gonna if you're gonna do it, like do it. So at least we can yeah. respect you for the leap made. Another big issue I had with it was the boys. Like what? Like what a chance! What an opportunity for us to get many scenes of actual like some horror movie stuff. Like yeah, some, I agree. Some kills. Let's let's do a couple flashbacks or do. You know, I like the idea of like 
we kind of had the this like outer world look and the boys were showing up in the room but like have that effect and let me see the grabber in that kid and what happened in that room instead mm-hmm. of them just kind of like alluding a oh I was a I was a naughty boy we had to play naughty boy and then I died it, it just was like this is I was like it's stupid I'm not I don't see anything they don't set any scare up with it I was just like what a wasted opportunity yeah that would obviously be a very easy way to Maybe not all, like, four or five of the boys, but definitely when they're telling their stories, you could have very easily had whatever happened to them being acted out on screen or showed, shown on screen. Because the way he does it in the movie is with the sister with, like, some flashbacks and dream sequences and whatnot. And for whatever reason, they put, like, the VHS filter over it and they try and make it look like it's, uh, like, home video. And I honestly can't think of any reason to do that other than evoking Sinister's, like, found footage, like, tapes, like, snuff film tapes, essentially. I I was just kind of like, yeah, cool. It's a a nice aesthetic. Of course, it's it's interesting. It's more interesting than just a normal flashback. But it's like, it makes no sense in the movie, like, why they would go that direction other than to evoke Sinister, of course. Like we said, there's just a lot of plot holes. Like, you know, the sister has the dream about, uh, like, the the rock star guy or whoever he was like the the arcade guy yeah the arcade guy yeah it was like it didn't really make sense so she he gets put in this cop car he attacks this kid he's then yelling things that he's actually saying on the phone to finn but like the only reason she's having this dream is because they're like hey let's uh let's show the audience like a backstory to one of these kids i mean i never i didn't understand the backstory i'm like all right so this guy's arcade game messed up (laughs) and he beat the shit out of a bunch of kids and he like carved something he carved like that code into the kid's arm which doesn't help because or i guess it was the house number into yeah. the into the arm yeah it, it didn't really help because it wasn't the right house number so no and yeah i i i don't know about that it's just i don't know the more and more i think about it you mentioned kind of like the naughty boy the naughty kids and like how he's fighting the kid really the the kid that is actually naughty before we get into the actual grabber situation like is the sister like she's the one who's cursing and swearing and she's the one who is like fighting back against her father which obviously i would too in this scenario i'm not i'm not on the father's side of like beating the shit out of his daughter but like she winds up like uh bludgeoning like one of the kids like one of the bullies with a rock and i was kind of like oh shit that kid's gonna like he's toast like you know it was a good hit right in the head with the rock that i was kind of like If you wanted to go this whole, like, the grabber is passing, like, judgment on these kids, you know? It's like, well, if you're a nice kid, you will survive. If you're naughty, I will kill you. It would have been more interesting thematically if the sister was the one that got grabbed realistically because her character was very much, like, she was in trouble with the principal. She was in trouble with the police. She was in trouble with, obviously, bludgeoning this one kid. So I almost think the movie may have had a stronger case if she was in there and maybe you know her clairvoyance or her ability to kind of consort with the dead could have allowed for those kids like stories to play out if she was actually locked in the basement you know a little bit better i 100 percent agree with i think the real issue is that they couldn't do it because then it would be a short because the sister would then just beat the shit out of ethan hawk so yeah so obviously like how the kid how finn winds up beating ethan hawk is like all the kids come together but for me it was a little bit like man finn you have a lot of time in this basement the kids tell you explicitly what to do how to escape and every single time he like kind of gives up like he tries it once and then just gives up like the only one he continuously does is like the the digging you know he digs like probably three or four times in the movie but like he manages to get the grate off of the the window. And yeah. then I was kind of like, there must be something in here that can kind of help you climb out of here. And then it's like, it shows like three or four different rolled rugs and carpets. I'm like, bro, just lean them up against the window, break the window and get out. Like once you got that metal grate off, he could have easily got out of there. So, and then the freezer one as well. I was like, there must be some way to like hit that freezer hard enough from the inside to like knock open the door, right? There must be something like he was just banging on it with his hands. But I was like, what about wedging something in there? What about kicking like instead of just punching a freezer door? There was multiple things where I was just like, okay, obviously it's to get this cool. Basically, a bunch of different things have to happen so he can kind of trap the grabber and kill him himself. But it's it's just 
a Joe Hill was, Home Alone. Yeah, it was it was just kind of like the character seemed smarter to me than kind of what the movie allowed him to be at a certain point. Like it was just kind of like we're in this holding pattern is what I call it where it's like all right, he learns something about the kids. He tries to escape like the kids. He can't escape. All right, then we cut outside to show what the sister's doing. She's talking to the police or she's praying or something, you know? And then it's like, all right, we're back in there again. And it just keeps doing this cycle, this pattern over and over and over again. That's that's how the movie goes. I was going to say, like, I, one of my kind of last points on it, which is, I guess, kind of like a side note on it. I, I'm interested how a mainstream audience is going to view kind of with the ending. I thought it was a a it was a very bizarre redemption but no redemption for the father where we get like this hug and a brace and I'm sorry. Yeah. And I was like this is I just felt really weird about that as an ending cuz I'm like this dad is a piece of shit and this entire movie we're watching him, you know, drink Till he's passed out, drinking, beating his kids, just generally treating his kids like a piece of shit. And then, you know, they find his son and he says, oh, I'm sorry. And, you know, gets on his knees and then they all just kind of are there as a family. And it's like, we're, we're there. And I was just like, this is really bizarre that we, we, A, we're even allowing this character to have like this redemption, redemption. of yeah. and all he does is say I'm sorry. He said, "Oh, I'm you know, I don't even remember. I don't think he even said like I'm gonna try better, be better." He just said, "I'm sorry." I was just like, "This is just it, it's really awkward." I was like, "I feel like if you have a topic as heavy as that in your film, yeah." I was like, "Maybe, maybe you should have either a killed him off or b like there needed to be more of him involved." And maybe like turning the drinking to around himself in some way. Yeah, it's basically he should have just been an absent father who's an alcoholic that like in his grief of his wife, I think it's referenced that she committed suicide that, yeah. you know, he he can't even really deal with his kids at all because he's drinking so much and he's so like depressed and himself. Right. And doesn't really yeah. even want to live like he's self-destructive. But the fact that he's like actually like physically beating these kids and cursing them out and he's such a negative presence where like even Finn's like on Friday nights I have to go home and take care of dad to make sure he doesn't like go off his head and stuff and that's happens multiple times within the first 20 to 30 minutes of the movie that yeah I don't really want to see the character redeemed in any way there's one scene nearing the third act where Gwen kind of basically is like don't get angry at me dad but I had a a dream that might be able to save Finn, and he's, like, of course, more receptive to it at that point. But, like, that's not enough. This is a shitty father. Next weekend, he's going to drink and beat the shit out of both of them and forget one of them was missing. It's it's It, it was unnecessary. If, if it's an absent father that in the third act kind of realizes, like, wow, my life is even more, like, shitty without these kids, and they had a hug, I could probably be like, okay, whatever. But the fact that he's, like, so physically abusive and just nasty, it's just like... Nah, I I wasn't feeling that at all. But I also wasn't feeling the absolute, like, actual ending scene of the movie (laughs) where it's just, like, all the kids at school are, like, so amazed that, like, Finn killed the grabber and they're all, like, staring at him. And he goes into the room of the one girl that he kind of flirted with a couple of moments uh, throughout the movie, kind of his lab partner, that she accepted him even when, you know, he was a weak and a bullied kid, you know, and she, you know, she liked him anyways. And he's just like, she's like, oh, Finny, like, hey, how are you doing this morning or whatever? I heard what happened. And he's like, call me Finn. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, what is this ending? I was like, is it trying to be like a cute double meaning for how like movies used to put Finn on screen as like the last ending? Is this just saying he's no longer a kid? He's a man because he murdered the grabber in cold blood. Like, obviously, I understand it's the whole He's fighting back for himself now, and he's he won't be bullied anymore. But it was just a weird ass like way to end this movie. Like it was completely unnecessary. I thought like we didn't have to end that way. It was bizarre. But yeah, is there anything else you really want to discuss before we get into the ratings? I mean, I think we've said enough about it. Uh, I mean, there's there's not much to talk about really. Yeah, I do have one note that he could have easily killed the grabber earlier in the movie when he sneaks upstairs and he has, like, his rocket ship that he already, like, you know, carved the the grabber's arm at one point. Not to mention, I think there's a knife block in the kitchen with, like, knives put into it. 
and the grabber is passed out cold. He could have easily just murdered the dude if he was if his plan all along was to murder him, you know? <laughs> like Or what about what about the glass pop bottle that he gives him many yeah. glass pop bottles. The room is soundproof. He could have yeah. just broke it, you know, cut some material off the mattress so you don't cut your hand and then just when you go upstairs like slice the guy's throat. What about that concrete proof uh, back of the toilet, you know, that he <laughs> digs a big, like, one meter by one meter hole in the wall? He could have just smoked the grabber with that. So, yeah, it's, I don't know, this is a movie, the more we discuss it, the more I kind of find uh, a bunch of things that are kind of giving me pause. So, I, I'm pretty conflicted on it. Um, yeah, I, I guess we'll get into the, the rating. I, I, I can't really belabor it anymore. Let's get into it. Um. If you're new to the podcast, our review rubric is nay, okay, yay, or slay. So, Rowan, uh, what would you give the black phone? So, I'm going to give this the weakest of okays. I I don't feel comfortable giving it a nay. I mean, we kind of said, like, it's a competent film. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not seeing, like, you know, some guy bringing you a film that cost him $30 to make on Windows Movie Maker, like... It's def- definitely a studio release, but yeah, a, a soft okay. To me, the best thing in the whole movie was probably just uh, the Blumhouse intro and recalling all the amazing films Blumhouse has, you know, put out. And I, I that might have been the high point of the entire movie for me. I... Like we said, it started off pretty strong. I like the tone, but the tone and the look totally changes once we get into that room. I like maybe 20 minutes of this movie, uh, which also says exactly what we've been saying. Like, maybe there's a reason this was a short story. Maybe mm-hmm. this should have been a short film. Just because I, I think they had to probably expand a lot of stuff from the short story that isn't there and they didn't do a very good job expanding it and creating this world. So, I mean, like I, like I said before, uh, the spoilers, I, I think if it's on VOD or something and you're bored, like, you could probably do worse with your time, but you could do a hell of a lot better. I, I'll say this right now, uh, we just recently reviewed, like, Firestarter, I'd rather watch Firestarter than I would watch this. Wow, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was like, that's a cooler powered kid, and I was like, at least like the soundtrack's good, and I was like, I had more redeeming qualities for me than this. Especially, I think, how I build up Sinister. I love Sinister. Yeah. And this just, this isn't it, dog. This isn't it. He, uh, he should have came with something a little stronger. Uh, what do you rate it? Oh, man, I'm still really conflicted. I. I feel like as far as like a letterbox score goes, I probably would give it a 7 out of 10, which in our score kind of translates to a yay. But uh, it, it's like where you said it's the softest okay, it's like it's the softest yay for me. Like I said, there's too many like technical aspects of the movie in terms of just like I do believe Scott Derrickson knows how to make a movie. It does feel like it has a budget. I do really like the child performances. I like the mask, you know. It's almost like one of those movies where I like so much about it, but it just kind of, it just all falls apart a lot after 20 to 30 minutes. It's one of those movies, the more I talk about it and the more I think about the plot and the little details and the ways they went, it just kind of irritates me. I don't know. I, I think for now I'll just settle, like I said, on a really soft yay but I would not be surprised if, like, next week after I think about it some more, it's it's a three out of five on my letterbox, which then would be a okay, right? It's it's just basically I just quickly looked at other movies I gave a three star to within the past month, and I think I like this, like, a hair better than some of them. So, I don't know. It's overall, regardless, it's very disappointing, and um, I also can't really see myself watching it or rewatching it like anytime soon i've only seen sinister once or twice and i've never seen sinister too so i think i'll go ahead rewatch the original sinister here within the next couple of weeks and then i know sinister 2 is supposed to be bad but maybe i'll check that out instead i personally would prefer this over firestarter so you know <laughs> i think i gave firestarter an okay so yeah let's settle on the softest of yays i guess but yeah with uh that i think basically all that's left is you know, if if you made it this far and you're not following us already, 
uh, do so on all of our social medias at uh, at It Slays Podcast. So we're on Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, Letterboxd, Slasher. Anywhere there's a chance for us to have social media, it's probably at It Slays Podcast. And yeah, uh, Rowan, how about you plug the horrific playlist? Like we've been getting some uh, comments. People have been asking about where to find it. So yeah, so yeah, tell them. We'll uh, we'll let you know right here. Hopefully, you're listening to this episode. If you ask the question, <laughs> uh, so if you're on Spotify, if you look up It Slays Podcast Horrific Playlist. Uh, we're on there, but also any of our social medias, we have our like link tree on there and we, yeah. we ha- have a button that'll take you right to it. Click on that. And I'm sure if you even Googled it slays podcast, horrific playlists is probably going to pop up right. Spotify beside it. Uh, but yeah, check it out. Follow it. Uh, you know, we, I, I keep saying we update it semi-regularly. Uh, I've got a list. On that. I've on, got man. a list. You know what? I'm going right. to do it tonight. You know what it is, okay. guys? It's uh, Exilia actually still runs it. So Exilia is the gatekeeper, and I just keep forgetting to give her the list I've made in songs. <laughs> so you know, oh, yeah. blame it on Exilia. So you know what, guys? Tonight I plan on sitting down. X is finally gonna watch X tonight. So oh, wow, uh, I'm gonna say, hey, I need you to throw these songs on. I don't know if anything's gonna make it uh, from this one. I. There was no memorable music, I don't think. I think the opening title song is pretty good. I think it might just be called Opening Title or The Black Phone. I think it's... I'll revisit it. Maybe it. Re- yeah, maybe revisit that and see if it fits. I think that's probably the only piece of music in my head that really stands out. Yeah, so... But, but yeah, go go check that out. Get your spooky music on. Uh, that's enough for me. Yeah, and uh, usually I kind of say what we're going to be reviewing next, but... Honestly, when I looked at the Now Slaying kind of schedule, the only thing that's a big major release that's coming out anytime soon was uh, Jordan Peele's Nope. And that's in basically almost a month from now. So I'd say there's a chance we'll probably find something else to review. Maybe something coming to streaming or, you know, a hidden gem or something. But, I mean, if there's nothing else, I mean, we'll definitely be doing Nope in a month's time. We're not missing that. (laughs) Yeah, I think that pretty much uh, wraps things up uh, this week. So... Until next time, I'm Colton. I'm Rowan. And as long as you keep listening, we'll keep slaying.